It's 4 o'clock on Wall Street. Do you know where your money is? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Closing Bell. I'm Maria Bartiromo. We're at the New York Stock Exchange. And as we're following at the close tonight, a dramatic reversal of fortune on Wall Street today. The session lows today in late day trading, a big turnaround for the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. So what happened with us today? Tom Belisis is from John Thomas Financial and Todd Schoenberger from the Black Bay Group. Also with us, our own Simon Hobbs and Mandy Drury. Good to see you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Hawaii, good good to have you on the program. Thank tell you me, very tell much. me how you want to be allocating money here. We had a huge reversal of fortune when you were selling into the rally earlier this week because of the Europe headlines. Is this all about Europe? I think all the whirlwinds that are taking place right now is Europe focused right now because of the fact that if Europe, if Greece does leave the euro, people are nervous that they'll get their dollars devalued and their purchasing power will go down a lot less. So people are very focused on Europe right now. As soon as that subsides, I think the market will present itself as a huge opportunity here at these levels. We, 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 we're still watching Facebook, of course, and we want, we want to bring Kayla Tausche in here because Kayla has some breaking news on the Facebook story uh, with the NYC involved here. Kayla, over to you. Yeah, Maria, it appears that N the NYSE is actively courting Facebook for its listing, even though it just listed on the NASDAQ less than a week ago. Of course, we're all familiar with the glitches that have happened there. And as far as the source familiar with the situation, telling CNBC that there has been communication both on email and phone and that Facebook has been receptive at least to communicating about the idea of potentially listing on the NYSE. Unclear how developed these communications are, but we do know that there have been communication on that topic. Maria? All right, so really interesting. You know, they were fighting so hard for this deal. NASDAQ got it. We had a bungle deal. And, of course, NYSE wants to be the white knight here. We'll uh, keep following <laughs> this, uh, Kayla. Thanks a lot for that. Simon, let me turn back to Europe here because this really was what was driving the markets today. What did we learn? I mean, what was it really that took this market back from the lows? I think probably the event risk. It's just gone 10 o'clock at night in Brussels and of course you have all the leaders of the European Union there. They will break up soon. They'll start briefing their own press packs and there's a possibility of course that you get something that's quite positive. I mean that's not what we're expecting bar the fact that they'll say look we'll meet again at the end of June after the Greek elections. Here perhaps are some of the things we quite like to have in place but this looks uh, smells like a short covering rally. Uh, some people suggesting it's got to do with the Financial Times article that came out listing what the ECB might might do moving forward. Uh, others suggesting that it's because, for example, Italy and Spain seem quite united in going into this, along with France, that they would push for euro bonds. But I think it's highly unlikely from the rhetoric from the Germans, which is so hard, so assured, that you'll get any euro bond news out of this, Maria. But, but you know, we're still wondering what happens with Greece. I mean, is, is all about, you know, saving Greece in the euro? Is, is that what we're talking about here at the end of the day? Or well, does I, it really make a big difference huge, if, in fact, Greece leaves? Absolutely huge, because we're staring at the unknown. Yes, a lot of the banks around Europe have taken provisions and written down the debt that they have, but it's that run on the banks. It's the fact that people will withdraw their money in Greece for fear it will be converted, converted to the drachma overnight, and people in Ireland might do the same, or Portugal might do the same. And if you start getting bankruptcies, and there will be bankruptcies in Greece, right. and people that have assets in Greece, importantly, you know, how do you value those once they're worth half or a quarter of, the, of what they were? Then the whole thing becomes very problematic for all the banks again. So we're still staring at a huge amount of uncertainty, really, Maria, until we get the result of that Greek election. And Maria, Maria, if I could yeah. just jump in there for a second, which is why if Greece does decide to leave the Eurozone, my bet would be that it would do it on a weekend when the banks are not open in Europe, because you do not want to be leaving the Eurozone. Essentially, when banks are open, you could see a huge run on the banks, people saying, I'm going to go to that bank and I'm going to get my savings out right now. You know, I, I'm wondering who are the beneficiaries of this money. A, at this point, when you've got the nervous depositors taking money out, I mean, we heard last week Santander uh, reporting $316 million coming out of deposits on Friday. Uh, people were just nervous. So if people are nervous taking money out of some of these banks, whether it be in Spain or Italy or certainly in Greece, who's the beneficiary of that, Mandy? Are we seeing money moving into the Deutsche Banks of the world, the seemingly stronger players in Germany? Well, you know, this is obviously one of the areas that is perceived as a, as a safe haven in inverted commas, whether or not it will be at the end of the day a safe haven is anybody's guess. But, you know, obviously we've seen record low yields on, on German bunds in the same way that we've been seeing record low yields on U.S. Treasuries as well, which is, of course, perceived as another safe haven. But, you know, I think what is a really interesting thing here is, in terms of our markets, there's a real push and pull, Maria. On the one hand, yes, you have these fears of a Grexit, or what we like to say on street signs is eurosis, a lot of fear about all things European, versus what does seem to 
to be an improving backdrop here at home. You know, you've got oil prices dropping down. That's more money, obviously, in right. U.S. consumers' pockets. You've got great things coming out of the auto sector. You've got, for example, you know, Chrysler and Ford putting out more output over the summer instead of their usual two-week summer shutdown. And, and yeah. housing is getting better we, we as wanna, well. We want to get these numbers out here on uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, Hewlett Packard reporting earnings of 98 cents a share versus an estimate of 91 cents a share. Yesterday, of course, we heard from Dell and the stock took a real hit in the extended hours because both the revenue and the earnings were below expectations. Hewlett Packard looks to be uh, above estimates at 98 cents versus 91 cents a share. I'm going to come back to Tom and Todd to try and figure out how the earnings picture looks. But let me get to John Ford for a moment uh, on the second quarter for Hewlett. John, what can you tell us on these numbers? Well, some good news and some bad news, Maria. As you said, the good news, uh, revenues did come in uh, a bit above. Also, non-GAAP EPS a bit above, but yeah. guidance. They're guiding to EPS for Q3 of uh, 94 to 97 cent range. Uh, the street was looking for a dollar two cents. Now, at that range, you got a question uh, whether they're going to be able to hit their uh, non-GAAP uh, EPS target for the full year of at least four dollars. Let me read through uh, and see if they say anything about that. But I can give you something on the segments. The per Personal Systems Group uh, was flat as far as growth uh, year over year. That's better than they did last quarter when they were down 15%. Services was down 1%. Last quarter it was up 1%. The Printing Group down 10%. That's uh, worse than they were last quarter. And uh, ESSN, that's uh, storage, networking, and uh, and some other stuff, down 6%. They were down 10% last quarter. So mixed bag guidance, probably a bit disappointing. Very interesting to hear what they're going to say on the call, Maria. It really is. These numbers look good. The stock is actually trading higher. Let me get over to you, Todd, because we got a better number on Hewlett Packard, certainly different than what we saw on, on, on Dell. But uh, in terms of earnings overall, is this the driver of this market or is there something else? Well, you would think that it would be. I mean, first of all, the first quarter of this year, I think we were considering a lot of accommodation uh, factors there. We really thought Bernanke and company might be doing something. They obviously didn't. And then we had to turn our attention to earnings. The, the problem with earnings, though, when you look quarter over quarter, you're only seeing a 3% growth rate, whereas a year ago, we we're at 12 plus percent. So really looking for some catalyst to really get this market started. We could turn to earnings. We just don't see it there. You see the guidance was poor on the Hewlett Packard report. But then going forward, is there anything that we can get from the Federal Reserve? I'm not Tom, so what, sure. Tom, what do you think about that? You know, that? corporate profits have been strong. I think a lot of people are nervous with what's going to happen with this upcoming election. There's a lot of money on the sidelines. Right. So as soon as people get a little more confident, that might.